Charles the First is Cromwell, and George the Third reason, reason, and George the Third may profit by their example. If this be treason, make the most of it. <laughs> Come out there. <laughs> I guess it is. Well, if it's who I think it is, a finger in the ribs will give me the answer. Oh, 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 oh. It's the giggle of Cyril Jackson. <laughs> well, it was fun while it lasted. And now for some music. Patrick, I think you'll find him in the study. Well, if it's politics, he's talking. I'll have him straight out. He was going to play his fiddle tonight and forget politics. War will come. It has come already. And mark you me, we'll have to fight for liberty. One of these days, Patrick, they'll take you out and hang you. Better a glorious death, Peyton, than an inglorious life. But to be sent back to England and put in prison there, as I understand they're doing now, if one as much as breathes the word liberty. No, no. Too great a price to pay for being outspoken. Have you gentlemen gotten there's a party tonight? Oh, forgive us, Doxy. Come, Pendleton. We'd best go back or our wives will put us in prison for neglect. I'm terribly sorry, my dear. I hope you'll bear in mind what's just been said about England and the prison. Oh, I doubt they'd do that to me. That's what William Saunders said. And he's in jail now. And his wife and babies are having to feed off their neighbors. I'd feel so much happier, Patrick, if you'd not talk any more politics. It scares me. There, there. No harm is going to come to me. So stop looking as though you're a widow already. And remember what poor Richard says. If you'd have your guests marry with cheer, be so yourself, or at least so appear. Here's your violin, Patrick. We're all waiting for you to play. Thank you, my dear. And what will you have me play? Something classical? Or some... Oh. Now, it's like a bad neighbor. You never can count on him when you need him. <laughs> we'll wait for my music. Come while I'm restringing. Sing the song you've written for the Sons of Liberty. If you wish it, Patrick. But the song has been declared treasonable, you know. You're in my house, ma'am. I'll be responsible. Doxy will play it for you, won't you, my dear? Oh, of course, but close the window. It is better to be safe than sorry. <laughs> Let's unite, soldiers of freedom, as we fight, soldiers of freedom. Of a tyrant's deep eye, we'll make liberty our cry. Let us live, not to surrender, but give all to defend her. And together we'll stand till liberty rules our land. By the sword, tyrants will perish. Our reward, freedom will cherish, for the right will command. As for liberty we stand, let us live, not to surrender, but to give, or to defend her, and to give. Your name, sir? Thomas Faulkner. Mr. Faulkner, I place you under arrest. Upon what warrant, sir? On the charge of giving voice to treasonable and seditious sentence. By whose authority do you enter here in this manner? As commissioner and authorized agent of His Most Gracious Majesty and Imperial Sovereign, King George III. But what right have Best you to have break... a care, Mr. Henry. I have a list of names of those men who are opposed to sovereign rule in Virginia. Your name is among them. Any resistance to authority on your part, and I'll place you under arrest also. Let's not make it any worse than it is, Patrick. I'll go with the commissioner. 
My hat and coat. I'll come after you, Tom. I'll not let them hold you long. What are you going to do, Patrick? Everything I can, Peyton. This is just one step nearer the time that we must arm ourselves against invasions of this kind. I ask your pardon for a short while and beg that you make my home yours while I'm gone. Promise me you'll... you'll say nothing against the king, Patrick. All right. Promise? Yes. Say it. I promise you I'll say nothing against the king. Now, go inside and see to your guests. And trust me to handle this matter wisely. British soldiers have fired on the citizens there, killing three and injuring two. Mr. Adams thinks it's time for immediate action. He's right. One of the conditions, inaction becomes treason. Moses, attend to Captain Milton. Come with me, Thomas. I'm going to write to Patrick Henry. Now is the time for him to speak. Arm Virginia and the others will follow. This is our great moment. Do not fail me. I am your affectionate friend, George Washington. You'll not forget your promise to me, Patrick. Is it fair to ask me to keep that promise now? This is a moment that can't be lost. There are others who can speak for the cause. But Washington expects me. Who knows? This may be the thing that will turn the tide. Patrick, think of all you stand to lose. Is it fair to all we've builded for these many years? What will become of us? What will become of us if we stand silent and let oppression rule us? If the word comes, I'll not be the one to hold you back. But let someone else take the initiative. You know and I know. You've been told by friends, warned by the king's commissioner, that any more outbursts will be the warrant for your arrest, imprisonment. Your solemn promise to me is the only thing that reassures me. You'd best come with me to keep your eye on me. No. We'd both be safer by my staying home. If I went with you, you'd be asking me again and again to take the word back. I might not be able to say no another time. But leaving me with a kiss, and a promise. I know you'll be true to both. Well, why didn't Patrick Henry speak? Maybe he was waiting the occasion. No, no, there were two or three times when I expected him to claim the floor. Something seems to be holding him back. And again, he may not be prepared. Oh, Henry not prepared. I've heard him on too many occasions to think that. No, it is something else. Well, Mr. Henry, I was hopeful you'd address the house today. The spirit was not in me, Colonel. You're not ill? No. There's something lacking in me. The cold words, like cold food, are slow to warm the blood. How was Mrs. Henry? She was quite well when last I saw her, thank you. Isn't she with you? No. I wanted her to be here, but for once she elected to remain at home. Good day, Colonel. Good day, Mr. Henry. You're right, Colonel. Something has happened to the man. He's not the same person we saw in Philadelphia. The doctor would say he needed bleeding or a pill. And I think I can prescribe for Mr. Henry's ailment. If I can be of any help in curing him, I beg you to command me. Then these are my commands. Get me a courier and the swiftest horse in Virginia. His wife. So 
only fair to remind you, Mr. Henry, that any speech-making on your part may prove very unwise. And now, in conclusion, let me say that our greatest folly lies in openly defying the very forces we seek to negotiate with peacefully. Not until we have exhausted every known means of conciliation with the Crown have we the right to arm against the Crown. Let us not sharpen the axe to sever our own head. Therefore, I say that we must not arm. We must not show belligerence. We have not the power, the money, nor the right to dare such a move. Let not Virginia become another Boston. Virginia must not, shall not take up arms. <laughs> The chair recognizes Mr. Patrick Henry, delegate from County Hanover. No man, Mr. President, thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as the abilities of the very honorable gentleman who has blessed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights. And therefore, I hope I will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if entertaining as I do opinions of a character opposite to theirs, I speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the House is one of awful moment to this country. For my part, I consider it as freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British Ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which the gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the House. Is it that insidious smile with which our petition has lately been received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. He acts as though he was afraid to speak out. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed by a kiss. Your Excellency, I have just come from the church. Patrick Henry is making a speech. Very Sorry. well. I see no reason for further delay. You have your orders to arrest him. Yes, Your Excellency. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with the warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjection, the last arguments to which kings resort. I ask the gentleman, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into subjection? Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us, and they can be meant for no other. They were sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry have been so long forging. And what have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last ten years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up to every light of which it is capable. But it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? And what terms shall we find which have not already been exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves longer. We have done everything that could be done to avert the storm that is now coming on. We have petitioned. We have remonstrated. We have supplicated. 
and we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and insult. Our supplications have been disregarded. And we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the court. In vain after these things may we indulge the vain hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve inviolate those inestimable privileges for which we have so long been contending, if we mean not to basely abandon that noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest has been obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir. We must fight. An appeal to arms and the God of hosts is all that is left to us. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when will we be strong? Will it be the next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a British guard is stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we learn the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope? Sir, we are not weak if we make use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess is invincible to any force our army can send against us. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations who will raise up our friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the brave alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, and let it come. I repeat, sir, let it come. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the cracks of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God! I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Yeah.